So this talk is not um, a, a regular talk. I was asked by Antonio Galvez and Christophe Cousin to uh, talk about the problem of how we can um, assess how Im what the importance of the single neuron model actually is if it is embedded in, uh, in a large scale network. And um, this, this work is done in the um, con context of the IHP thematic program, random processes in the, in the brain. So as I said, this is not a regular talk. It, it uh, does not um, contain new results, um, but is um, uh, proposing um, uh, a concept. And uh, this concept then is open for discussion. So here's the abstract that you, uh, that you know. And the, the outline um, of this talk will be that I will first uh, introduce a model of a cortical microcircuit as a building block. So this will be uh, our network. Then I will uh, show you some uh, limitations of this network model um, and address uh, in, in how far such um, available network models can be used as research platforms and um, how they serve today as benchmarks for neuromorphic computers and also um, indicate some uh, potential um, uh, extensions of the model that we um, may want to do or not and then um, show you an initial list of alternative single neuron models that are widely used in the, uh, in the community. Uh, but, but of course, this is also open for discussion what the, what the list of useful models is. Uh, and I will introduce some metrics um, that we can use to compare these models. Um, um, but on the, um, on the basis of these metrics, I will also discuss a bit what the limitations of the predictive power of the chosen network model may actually be and, um, uh, and indicate that we may need to go beyond the stationary state. And then I will conclude uh, with uh, uh, one slide on what a project design uh, could be. At the end of the talk, I have um, uh, lots of references, uh, which we don't go through here. They appear throughout the talk. Um, uh, but for later on, we will have them uh, available, of course. So this um, talk was uh, prepared with, with a number of people that you uh, see on the left. Um, the Neuromat people uh, know several of them uh, quite well, uh, especially Renan Shimura, of course, who, who you see in the audience. And um, uh, on the software side, which is shown on the right, there are actually a large number of more people involved. So why is the, the cortical network of, of interest for this? Let me first answer this question from a technological perspective. Um, modern AI is, excels on, on, on many tasks, but, but natural brains are still uh, un, unbeaten in natural tasks, like learning from a few examples, or the eye-hand coordination that, that, we, that we need for robotics. So understanding brain function is still a major goal, also from the technological perspective. Um, but there's also another aspect, and, and this is that modern AI algorithms are optimized for present-day uh, computers. Um, and this has a terrible price, and the price is energy consumption. If you just compare that our brain uses uh, 20 watts of power, um, but a um, state-of-the-art supercomputer already uses um, two megawatts. And um, technology-wise, we are, we are coming uh, at a limit so that we cannot easily um, reduce this, this power consumption with regular technology a lot. So also here, the hope is to uh, learn how to build novel computers by using principles uh, of the brain. So where is the, actually the difficulty in this? On the right side, um, you see a photo um, of, of a neuron on the upper right. 
and you, you can see that the uh, diameter of the cell body is, a, is about uh, 20 microns. Uh, below you see a photo of a state-of-the-art transistor uh, which has dimensions of about 20 nanometers, meaning that in technology we can already produce structures that are three orders of magnitude smaller than the relevant structures in the brain. And the figures on the left side show you that also in terms of the number of elements uh, in technology, we are not far away from the number of elements uh, in, in the brain if you compare this to modern microprocessors. The problem lies in the wiring. Here on the right side, you see um, uh, another photo of cortical tissue, but here the axons are uh, labeled in black. The white dots are not neurons, but blood vessels. And uh, if you would count the, num the length of the axons that, that you see in a cubic millimeter of this tissue, you arrive at a number of three kilometers. And this is a density of connectivity that cannot be achieved by um, any hardware that, that we have available. Um, uh, however, rem remember that our structures in technology are much smaller, so there is still hope that we um, can uh, uh, exploit this difference in, in size and also in switching speed to make up for this. On this slide, you uh, see cross sections through the brains of mammals, and uh, this is to indicate that in evolution, from mouse, which is somewhere in the lower right, to human, which is on the upper left. Um, the, the cortex has grown a lot in, in volume by three orders of, um, of magnitude, whereas its local shape uh, remains um, almost um, identical that you can um, appreciate on this uh, figure on the, on the right side where on the horizontal axis you have different um, animals again, and you see now a zoom in into the uh, local structure of the cortex, and you see that there's lots of similarity. And this similarity also spans across modalities. So independent of whether this tissue is processing visual information or auditory information or is uh, planning motor tasks, it looks essentially the same. So, so we have a dual um, universality here, which of course um, uh, motivates uh, theoreticians to look for um, generic principles that remain to be uh, discovered. So uh, our hope is that here uh, nature hit on a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a principle of computation that was so precious that it was um, preserved over, over evolutionary time and nature built, still, uh, just built more of it. Um, uh, accordingly, um, over the past decades, there have been um, many attempts to model this uh, local cortical circuit, um, starting from the um, breakthrough work by Douglas and Martin. And, and here I have listed um, uh, some of the important references and I would like to focus on the on the model that, that we built in our lab a few years ago um, and this is uh, based on a very simple uh, individual uh, neurons so basically the uh, integrate and fire um, neuron model and is just uh, taking care that the structure of the network is uh, represented accurately um, so here, the, the neurons maintain um, a, a voltage variable that you see on the, on the, on the left side. Um, the neurons are interacting by, by spikes. Once a spike arrives uh, at the, at the postsynaptic neuron, a small voltage excursion is elicited after a small delay. This is called the postsynaptic pot potential. Um, uh, However, these this panels that you see on the left side uh, represent the situation as you would see it if you have these neurons um, in, a, in, a, in, a, 
in, in a dish and you, you investigate them uh, unconnected to the rest of the network, if you would stick an electrode into a neuron in the, in the living brain, this is shown on the right side, then you would see large fluctuations of the membrane potential and uh, the emission of spikes at seemingly random times. Uh, we, we now know that this is, um, uh, to a large extent, is, is not noise that we are seeing in these fluctuations, but is coming from the um, 10,000 um, uh, synapses of a neuron that, that receive excitatory and inhibitory spikes um, all the time. And um, based on, on this particular single neuron model, we uh, build up a circuit that is representing all the neurons and all the synapses below a square millimeter of um, cortical surface. Um, this study uh, integrated the knowledge of 50 experimental papers that were available at the time in 2014. And this um, led to already uh, interesting spiking activity that is shown on, in this display on the, on, on the right side, where time is running on the horizontal axis. And we are looking uh, about a millimeter into the depths of the cortex. This, the spikes of excitatory neurons are marked in blue. The spikes of inhibitory neurons are marked in red. Of course, in the, in the brain, they would be uh, scrambled. But here, I, I've sorted them within the layers to just to guide your eye. And you see that, that clearly that there is a difference in the spike rate of excitatory neurons in the different layers and also of inhibitory layers, uh, inhibitory neurons. And the spiking activity is uh, asynchronous, um, irregular, as uh, experimenters find in, in, in recordings. So this uh, uh, attempt was um, uh, sort of um, successful. And um, uh, led to um, several mo more papers from, from other groups who either uh, directly um, um, used this um, model in, uh, in their own work be because we uh, published the, the whole uh, model code. This is what we wanted to achieve and is also cited by, by other studies. So in this sense, this model serves as a, as a building block for other studies. Um, however, the model can also be um, criticized in the sense that it is representing all the local synapses, but as a neuron receives 50% of its synapses from, from outside, 50% of the synapses remain unexplained. And also, if you look at the power spectrum of the activity, then you see that all the slow oscillations that we that we see in uh, in nature are missing from this uh, from this uh, model. Um, so in the next step, we tried to uh, build up a multi-area model, um, and this time of uh, macaque visual cortex um, by representing each of the thirty-two visual areas by by just one of these microcircuits, and um, uh, this was um, successful in the sense that we then have a different spiking activity in the different areas, as you see here in the upper raster diagrams on, on the left side. And um, uh, more importantly, we see um, a more interesting fluctuations in the population spiking activity, as it is shown on the left in the lower part of the plot. And this larger fluctuations are then the reason why now the, um, the power spectrum uh, fits much better to the experimental data. This is shown in the lower left. And also the distribution of spike ra rates uh, across neurons, uh, on, as shown on the right side, um, uh, it explains more of the experimental data. So that, that is some of the limitation that you have when you only look at a at a local cortical microcircuit. Um, this uh, technology wise, uh, this work was possible by using the NEST simulator, which is developed and maintained by the NEST initiative. This is a public society 
that is doing teaching and training at uh, major computational neuroscience courses, for example, also the uh, LASCON course in Brazil or uh, in a few weeks in, at the uh, CNS in, uh, in Melbourne. And I'm mentioning this here for, um, for the purpose of, um, of this talk that um, uh, having such um, uh, generic simulation engine means that we can simulate many different models with the same um, engine, which of course uh, opens up the opportunity that um, this simulation engine is well validated and, and optimized and therefore the risk of uh, making errors is uh, reduced a lot. Um, for some models, like um, our microcircuit uh, model here, um, it's possible to simulate this model also on different uh, simulation engines like the nest simulator, the neuron simulator, or even the Spinnaker neuromorphic hard hardware. Um, I will come back to this in a few slides, which enables us to cross-validate uh, the simulation engines uh, itself. And, and that's, of course, also uh, an exercise that, that um, increases reproducibility of, of science. Um, here are examples of um, such specific neuromorphic computers. Uh, on the right side is the, the system that I just talked about. Um, the, the, the model has become um, a benchmark for neuromorphic systems. And um, just in 2019, the Manchester group uh, managed to run this circuit um, on their system. In, in real time. Um, this is um, regarded as a breakthrough um, because it means that all larger networks should be easier to simulate because they are le less densely connected necessarily. And um, by uh, comparing this to simulation results with the simulation engine nest, uh, one could verify that the results are actually uh, correct. Um, what one has to uh, keep in mind to bring these results into perspective is that this model compared to the size of the neuromorphic computer is rather small. It occupies just 1% of the system. And these uh, studies then uh, led to, uh, uh, to a series of, of, of papers where people studied the performance of this circuit on uh, different variants of, of specific hardware like GPUs, um, FPGA systems, um, uh, and so on. Uh, however, also the uh, technology of conventional computers is not standing still. Um, here you see a recent system in, in our lab. This is just one pizza box size computer with 128 uh, computational um, uh, course. And uh, on this system, you can uh, appreciate on the uh, upper right plot that uh, when uh, all 128 cores are used, this circuit can be simulated uh, actually faster than real time and also has an energy consumption that is. Uh, below all neuromorphic uh, computing attempts so far. So for the purpose of um, our talk here, um, this means uh, that we can really do uh, a lot of simulations with the circuit because it's even faster than, than, than real time on, on a single box. So now I would like to come to a few uh, limitations of the model. Uh, meanwhile, there are a mean field theoretical description of the activity in this circuit that uh, well produce, reproduce the spike rates. This you see in the upper left and well reproduce um, uh, the power spectrum uh, that you see on the, on the lower left, uh, which, is, uh, 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 which is a good thing because it um, allows us to have much more control over the parameters. Uh, but it also means 
that maybe this circuit is uh, less constraining than, uh, than we in thought in the beginning, uh, because in, in this mean field theory, only the, um, the, the two first moments of the fluctuations in the network uh, enter the equations and not all the intricacies of the, um, of the connectivity. But by the way, this um, uh, mean field theory is uh, contained in a toolbox. You see the references on the right side. So uh, for a project like this one, this um, uh, theory would al already be uh, uh, available and can easily be adapted to, to other neuron models um, uh, uh, for the purpose of parameter estimation before you actually do um, simulations. Um, the, there is also um, a, a phenomenon in this um, circuit that you may already have noticed uh, in the power spectrum spectra of the slide before. And, and this is that when you um, look at the activity of many neurons in parallel, as is done on this um, uh, raster, the left raster diagram, you see vertical stripes. And these uh, vertical stripes are showing up as a peak in the power spectrum at about 300 hertz. Um, this is um, uh, not seen in, in, in physiology, and it's, it's probably an, an artifact um, of this model. And um, this is um, disturbing if you, for example, if you want to compute the local field potential of these um, uh, of these neurons, then, then this uh, clearly shows up. Um, we now know um, that this um, artifact goes away if you improve the anatomy of the model. And, and this is shown on the, on the right side. Um, this is now um, an, uh, um, a, a model where the, where the number of neurons is, is higher as it would be in one cubic millimeter of, um, of macaque V1. And, um, and then this, um, uh, these uh, high frequency oscillations uh, go away because there is a weaker coupling uh, between the neurons uh, as the number of synapses is uh, approximately the same in these, two, in these two circuits. So this is um, one of the potential improvements that uh, we may want to uh, to do or, or not. And, and also, um, uh, the neuroscience has ad advanced to a point where we now begin to have also anatomical knowledge, uh, uh, not only uh, about the connectivity of inhibitory neurons as such, but also on the different subtypes of um, inhibitory neurons that are available. And there, so there would be an option to um, also represent this in a, in, in a bit more realistic way. Here you, you see uh, a list of um, single neuron models that I, that I extracted from the literature as models that are used a lot, like the famous Itzikevich model, uh, for example, and uh, and others that you that you know of, uh, in, including the galvez lecher bach model. Uh, one um, particular distinction here is that there are models where the synapses are represented as currents. In other models, they are represented as uh, conductances. And um, a second major um, way of, of differentiating between the models is that there are some models who have a stochastic spike generation and, and others have a deterministic one. So the models I have listed here are all already implemented in NEST in C++. So there would be um, very little coding required to, to use them in a project like this. And also for, um, for some of the models, we already have descriptions in a domain specific language that is called NESTML. Uh, I brought you an example of how this looks like here on the right side. So, so this is a language which is very close to mathematical notation, uh, which um, gives the scientist more chances to 
directly compare models and also to, um, to spot uh, errors. Um, and in the next slides, I will just show you briefly uh, uh, um, how, how some of these models look like. This is a, it's a Kavich uh, model. It uh, con consists of uh, just two equations that are highly nonlinear. And depending on the parameters, um, you can model all sorts of um, uh, spike responses that you find in nature in, in response to a, to a DC current, like regular spiking, intrinsically blurred bursting, um, and so on. So it's very flexible and, and could be used for the cell types in, in the different layers and also for excitatory and inhibitory cell types. And, and uh, with the same idea, a different class of models are the GLIF models um, that, that have been developed by the uh, Allen Brain Institute. Um, the, uh, these models can uh, very well be uh, fit to um, uh, in vitro um, experiments and the Allen Institute actually showed that they fit the data better than the multi-compartment models that they also uh, use in their institute. And then there is the famous uh, MAT model by Kobayashi Tsubo and uh, Shinomoto, which in 2009 won the um, uh, quantitative single neuron modeling um, competition. You may remember this um, paper in science by Gerstner and, and Nord about this. It was a bit shocking that such a simple model has uh, such a success. And uh, then there is the galvez lecherbach model that many of you um, uh, know, know so well. Um, so um, Antonio, Christoph, and, and, and other people from, from our lab have started a, a few weeks ago of uh, implementing this into, into NEST. I, I think that that looks um, promising. So we have this um, then, then also available in a, in, a, in a short time, I would hope. So which brings us then to the question, how should we actually then uh, compare the network activity that is resulting from simulations of, of um, circuits with such different uh, neuron models? There are the, uh, the obvious measures that have been used um, throughout the past years, like the distribution of spike rates, the distribution of correlation coefficients, a single spike train uh, irregularity, uh, but we could also uh, look at measures of network synchrony and the spore spectrum of neural activity. And uh, maybe we should even uh, include um, functional metrics. Um, uh, I will come back to this in a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, uh, some limitations that, that, that are in this approach are um, that for computing second order statistics like um, the distribution of correlation coefficients already, uh, large amounts of data are, are required to, um, to really compare the data. In this um, reference here, Dasbach et al. Um, 21, this, this gives some, uh, uh, some, some examples and, and estimates of, of how long the simulation time actually has, has to be. Uh, uh, so this is not uh, completely trivial. Um, and as I said, uh, prominent, um, prominent measures like the power spectrum are already captured uh, by mean field theory. Um, so the, the question is, in, in how far can we actually expect that, that the neuron models will cause a different ne network um, uh, activity. So maybe this circuit is, is not really constraining the situation very much. Uh, and of course, um, uh, in this setting, uh, we have neglected all aspects of dendritic computation and plasticity because these uh, mechanisms are just not there. One, one has to keep this in mind. And uh, here, is an, 
example from the paper by Dasbach et al. Uh, just to um, uh, illustrate the, the predictive power of the circuit. Here, the authors are replacing the, um, the Gaussian distribution of synaptic weights that the original model has by just the mean value in, in all of the synapses. And they find that the distribution of firing rate, spike train irregularity, and spike correlation is indistinguishable. And, and that, that, that means you can, you can remove this complexity uh, from, the, from the model, um, at least according to these measures, without losing anything. And in, in the next slides, I will, would like to show you that there, that there may be, however, um, other properties of such circuits that are not so easy to discover and that may um, exhibit differences b between the, um, the neuron models. So here, um, these authors um, found um, an intermediate region between a regular network activity and chaotic activity that is optimal for, um, for memory. Um, they uh, find that um, this uh, state exists in, uh, in continuous um, network models and also in spiking models. And um, other work showed that you can uh, map a spiking network model on the left to the much simpler uh, binary neuron uh, description which in, uh, enables us to do much more analytical work. And uh, from, from this um, binary neuron models, uh, we can show that they can be mapped to continuous network equations uh, uh, in the sense that the autocorrelation structure uh, in, in both models, so continuous models and binary models, looks, looks exactly the same which uh, uh, in the first place means, oh, what, oh it means that the, that the uh, spiking networks are not adding anything extra. We can just uh, continue with um, continuous modeling. Uh, however, this may not be uh, entirely true um, because if one looks more into the details and, uh, and investigates how does the network trajectory of um, two nearby initial conditions uh, deviate, one finds uh, differences. And this I would like to um, show you on the next slide what this could mean in terms of network function. So uh, imagine now looking at the upper left that you have um, two nearby initial conditions that are caused by two very similar input patterns to the, to the neuron. Then for the one pattern, you would have a red trajectory, and for the other pattern, you have a blue one. And because there is additional noise, on a repetition of the experiment, you would have another red trajectory and another blue one. And, and that means that over time, this bundle of um, red trajectory would become wider and wider, and the bundle of blue ones would also become wider and wider. This is indicated by the two circles, um, but at the same time, um, these two um, bundles would, all, would also have some separation. And the finding is that um, uh, in the initial time after stimulus onset, these two bundles are moving faster away um, than their, um, their diameter increases. So there is a certain point in time where, where such input patterns can be um, optimally be um, separated. And this then, uh, th this is then um, shown here a bit more, more formally. Uh, so green is the, uh, the, 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 the distance be be between the, the two uh, bundles and uh, red is the, the diameter of in, in one bundle and the difference is the blue curve, and you sh show that there is a that there is a peak. If you express this in 
some measure of single strength that is shown on the right, then you see this a bit um, more clearly. And, and um, this feature is, um, is depending on, on the single neuron uh, uh, properties, so it could be different for the different uh, single neuron models to be, to be tested. And uh, another example um, of, an, of a higher order measure of um, a network activity is the so-called um, complexity distribution. Um, and, and this is the distribution of the number of simultaneous spikes that you find in one given um, time bin. So on the on the on the left in the in the in the middle panel you see such a such a distribution and this is uh, corresponding to this um, uh, dot display on the upper left that that shows these uh, this this network synchronization these vertical stripes and uh, as a consequence of this you see a rather rather um, flat uh, uh, complexity distribution. This is the blue curve that goes up to, to high complexities like 60. Uh, when you would scramble all the spikes randomly, and this, this is shown in the orange curve that's labeled surrogates, you would rather see this a bell-shaped curve with a, with a mean of around uh, uh, 20. So, so this measure, um, the complexity distribution um, uh, captures um, synchrony across the neurons in the, uh, in the network and is uh, very sensitive to um, to small uh, disturbances. But if we go away from the, from just looking at the stationary state, then uh, we may also see uh, entirely different effects. Um, here in the in the upper panel, uh, I um, show a simulation that should mimic the arrival of a visual stimulus into layer four and six in A, and uh, and uh, in B you see the the histogram of the spike responses in the individual layers, and what you see is that these individual layers have a different latency. So a layer four is responding first, followed followed by five, and then followed by two, three, and so on. And this is also something that that is um, known to to be measurable in experimental data, as you see on the bottom. And uh, it is, um, uh, of course, it is depending on how the network is constructed in detail. Here in in this example, the the upper panel is the situation I showed you before. And in the lower panel, uh, I have perturbed the so-called target specificity that tells you how likely is it that, that a synapse that is originating from an excitatory neuron will, will um, uh, target an inhibitory one. So if I perturb this natural ratio, uh, then you see that, this, that the circuit is still propagating this pulse, but now the, the ability of dampening uh, is lost and you see this ringing in, in several of the layers. And, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but at the time we int interp or we hypothesized that what is going on in this circuit is that uh, excitation is propagated from one layer to the next. These are the blue uh, blobs. But then the excitation of the receiving layer is exciting the inhibitory neurons in the sending layer, which then shuts off the sending layer as a kind of a handshake signal. And in, at least in, in, at the time in our model, we found this pattern repeated over several combinations of, of layers. So this is a kind of a kind of network mechanisms that, that may be present in, in such a circuit. If we want to do um, um, uh, this comparison, then uh, of course for, for all of the uh, different single neuron models, we would need to find 
uh, new parameters um, that are fitting the basic um, experimental data like uh, spike rates and uh, cross correlations. Um, for this, there, there has been um, a framework being uh, put up in the context of the Human Brain Project um, that, is, that is called uh, Network Unit. Um, this framework um, would be uh, uh, available to, to us uh, and could also uh, save a lot of um, programming work. So uh, finally, uh, my proposal for, for such an investigation would be uh, somewhat like this. Uh, we agree on a specific variant of the network model that would then be stay the same. Uh, we agree on a dynamical state of the model as a reference, like the resting state-like activity, for example, and, and on a set of metrics to, um, to fit. And um, of course, we um, have to decide in how far we want to go into cell type specific models or not. So, do we make the excitatory dynamics of depending on the on the on the layer and and different for inhibitory and excitatory cell times or not? Uh, once we have made these decisions, we could assign uh, interested researchers or groups to spe to specific neuron models and then all work in parallel. Uh, use the validation framework and the analysis toolbox elephant for doing the, the analysis in the same way. The uh, simulation laboratories at Ulich and Neuromat would certainly help with nest implementations and, and uh, other questions on the software. And then we probably need to agree on further more complex metrics to really find out uh, differences between uh, the, the circuits like the complexity distribution transients or this uh, relationship between chaos and function that I showed you. Um, we could um, uh, communicate over the year to sort out um, problems and um, then maybe uh, gather in March 23 in the, throughout the um, main phase of the thematic program and, and dis discuss these results in Paris. Thank you very much. Um, I have a general question. Um, okay, of course, it's very important to, to model neurons, but is it fair to say that when dealing with computation and also energy consumption, etc., is it fair to say that a lot of things are occurring at the synapse? And uh, my question is, if we really want to mimic nature, and in particular, its ability to produce very complex computation with a minimal energy cost, wouldn't it be um, uh, also a good idea to investigate uh, models of synapse? And in this yeah. case, uh, what, what, how, how does it fit with your architecture? Is it possible yeah. to generalize it? Uh, for, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that's a totally uh, relevant question, Bruno. Um, uh, I, um, uh, so, the, the first obvious step for me, and, and, and this is already uh, included in this table, is that we should look at current-based synapses and conductance-based synapses. Yeah, so there's still no plasticity, but, but we already know that this makes a difference. And, and uh, the next step would, of course, be to, to really look at, uh, at plasticity and, and see how the... Um, how the interaction of the single neuron model and then the particular plasticity uh, model um, uh, makes a difference. Um, the, the, uh, as the, 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 the major function of these circuits probably is, is to learn, as you, as you indicated, and then perform some useful function, maybe this is really the, the, the main point. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the only limitation is, is just complexity, yeah? So, so what do we include? Where, where do we stop? Yeah. Do we look at static models first and then move to plastic ones? Or do we all in one step 
I, I don't know, but but that's an important decision. No, uh, Max, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful talk. It was uh, exactly what we need now. And uh, you made a, um, a synthesis of uh, progress being made right now and questions to be solved. So, I'm, 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 by the way, thank you very much for accepting, including uh, the model Neomat has been built in Eva, Locherba, myself, Christophe. So, I'm, I'm very optimistic about it because w one of the questions is well, we have many candidate models, we have different mm -hmm. properties. Uh, Eva and myself tried to make to, to propose a, a very simple model. Simple in the sense that you can do mathematics with it, but yet with a interesting and complex behavior. So it would be great to, to compare. And uh, uh, when Christophe proposed this project to compare different models just by, uh, by looking uh, through simulations, uh, mm -hmm. which model was able to reproduce and the meaning of reproduce is not clear what method to use uh, uh, different phenomena. So it was obvious that we need to use NEST. Because NEST is there, it's a project meant to this. So I'm very happy that to NEST uh, is now part of this huge project. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, what are the phenomena? Because this answer is also part of the question Bruno asked. Uh, so yeah. uh, uh, there are so many different phenomena we could try to model. But we yeah. should decide what are the phenomena that you think is are crucial to address right now, like physicists do all the time. They have so, in your opinion, what are the neurobiological phenomena that we should try to model uh, right now? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I would say we we should start with the. Um, uh, with the obvious ones that the um, electrophysiologists are, are telling us for years that the um, that the the spike rates and the um, uh, the the spike train ir irregularity is different is depending on the cell type yeah so it's it's different for excitatory and inhibitory neurons and it's um, different um, across the layers and and this is also related then to the power spectrum of the population activity and um uh so so that i think that's something that we should do definitely uh, because this is also constraining the dynamical state of the near of the of the network yeah it, it's making the the uh related to the difference between an a state where the neurons more or less fire asynchronously or where, where they are all producing a single oscillation. Um, what I'm um, afraid of is that, that this is not sufficient uh, in, in the sense that the, uh, that the, the network model is not constraining these measures very much. And, and this is, I think, what the, these simple mean field theories tell us. Yeah, if you just take a few ingredients from this network model, for example, you, you forget about the distribution of synaptic weights and just use the mean value, you can reproduce these, these measures like, like spike rates and so on perfectly. So, I think if we want to learn more about the circuit and more about the differences that single neuron models make in the circuit, we have to use more clever measures. And these, and these more clever measures um, maybe are already from the functional domain. So, uh, uh, for example, how long can the can the the circuit um, uh, store a memory? So how good is is it in in separating two input patterns that are very similar? And and, and these kind of questions. And there has been prior work um, uh, of this. I, I I showed you just one example, but there is, for example, um, also um, 
uh, a famous study by um, Häusler and Maas from, from the um, lab of Wolfgang Maas, who is, who is in, uh, investigating the functional properties of a circuit, which is very similar to this one. So that, and, 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 and so this paper includes a measure that we could also use for such a purpose. So that, that would be my answer, Antonio. When you, you expose the, your, your microcircuit model, you, you, you expose, I mean, what has been uh, reproduced with the model, which is mostly the AI state, the yeah. dynamic state. But we know that the same circuit can also display uh, an oscillatory state, say when the, the subject is at rest or uh, uh, under non ram sleep, there's uh, slow wave fluctuations and up and down states. So I think these are not, this could be another uh, way of testing the model. The same model being able to uh, reproduce both uh, in a signals in irregular state and with adjustment of some parameters, displaying also uh, uh, an, an, an oscillatory state with low wave. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's a good idea, Antonio. Yes, because yes. I think this would limit some single neural models because. Uh, at least based on my own simulations, uh, uh -huh. it's important that the neuron has some form of adaptation in order to display mm -hmm. this type of uh, oscillatory oh, yeah. state. Yeah, without oh, adaptation, yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a say a leaf model without some adaptation, it's difficult to to, to reproduce a, a, a slow wave uh, type uh, state. So yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. That could, it could already um, rule out some of the models yeah. then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 